Okay, everyone ready? <laughs> Sorry for the delay. Um, thanks everyone for coming. It's our uh, colloquium with Computational Science Research Center, but it's also gonna be um, this week joint with the physics department. Our speaker this week is uh, Zach Wienersmith. Uh, he is best known for his uh, comic web series, Saturday Morning Breakfast Serial, or SNBC. He's also worked on several best-selling books, including an immigration policy best, uh, bestseller, Open Borders, a kid's adaptation of Beowulf, and then two pop science books. The first is called Soonish, and the second is the topic of our talk today, okay. <laughs> A City on Mars. Um, so without further ado. All uh, right. Hello, I'm operating two computers at once, so uh, wish me luck. Um, okay, so uh, my wife and I spent five years researching uh, the uh, human future in, in space, and it, this started with an idea which was that, you know, space settlement is going to get easier soon, there's these big rockets going up, and so we can write this really cool book about the next step of human expansion into space, so we thought we were going to write a really sort of uplifting book, and then about two years in... It, it, we ended up feeling like the project was much harder than expected and uh, that there were a lot of misconceptions in the public discourse and, um, and that a lot of people who are advocating for near-term settlement are just operating on false premises. And so the uh, theme of my talk is going to be, I'm sorry I'm ruining everything. Um, and so the way we do that in the book is we start with what we call space myths, which are sort of ideas about what we're going to do in space uh, that are probably false. Oh, that's, that's the book you should buy. Um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to cycle. Okay. First thing is something you may have heard of called the overview effect. Is anyone familiar with this? Yeah, okay, a couple people. So the overview effect is this idea uh, put forward by a philosopher named Frank White. He's still alive. And the idea is that when you get that view of the Earth um, from above, you see that thin blue band of atmosphere, you are enlightened, you become a sage or a philosopher. Uh, you know, I'm glad someone's giggling about this because people take it seriously. Um, so this is sometimes used as like why we should go to space. The problem is there's basically no evidence for it. Um, there's like very leading interviews conducted with astronauts about whether they became very wise um, having gone to space. Um, and we, we found a couple papers where people tried to measure it. And if you believe survey data from astronauts about how they're great, uh, you, you find a moderate personality shift. But no one's ever like measured do people actually behave better. And if you've read astronaut memoirs, uh, you know that there's a lot of stuff they get up to that doesn't suggest uh, that they are sages. Um, so probably not. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, next thing, uh, oh, and the other thing is that they often say, like almost every astronaut will say some version of this, is once you're in space, you go up there and you don't see borders, and it really changes the way you think, but actually you do see borders. Um, that's security lights between Pakistan and India. You can also see where North Korea is not. Um, it's in there somewhere, and uh, so, in fact, you do see borders from space, uh, so it's probably not on. Um, next thing people often say is, well, countries are going to cooperate better, and we cooperate in space. This is the International Space Station, where, uh, broadly speaking, Western countries and Russia have been cooperating for the last 20 years, and it doesn't seem to have resulted in cooperation down here, there's been scholarly research on this. It's a book called Politics of Outer Space by Von Bank, where he was writing from 1996, but I think it holds up, which says basically we cooperate in space when we're already cooperating on the ground. If you if you know your space history, you know the first big cooperation we did with the Soviets was the Apollo Soyuz test project in 1975 during detente. We didn't really cooperate much after that. And by the way, part of that was because of the Carter administration having concerns about human rights abuses in Russia, a perfectly good reason to not cooperate. Um, all right, then the next thing is there's this idea that, well, maybe we could save the planet by going to space. So, for example, can we move enough population to space that we could spell, spare the biosphere? Well, when you run the numbers, at uh, current rates, you need to move about 80 million people a year. So to put some, put a, you know, kind of fake graph on that, um, uh, you know, right now there's, I think, under 20 people in space, and that's a pretty good number. Uh, you need to get to about 200,000 a day in launches. That's just to launch the bodies, by the way. They'd probably like to live somewhere and have air. Um, and so another related proposal you hear from like Jeff Bezos is, well, okay, we'll move heavy industry to space because heavy industry is where the pollution comes from. So when you looked at a heavy industry, which was concrete production, where you need to produce like billions of tons per year, um, you know, the numbers on how many kilotons we can launch per year are minimal. I actually had a space guy arguing with me who said, if you just assume a 50% growth rate every year for the next 36 years, it all works out. Uh, that seems a little speculative. Uh, so, so probably you can't save these, the environment of Earth by this means. Uh, another proposal is we'll get rich by going to space. 
Uh, and basically, probably not. Uh, the, the money examined is up to geosynchronous orbit, about 24,000 miles out. You hear proposals, for example, that we're going to mine the asteroids for reasons I could get into. We don't think that's very plausible, at least compared to doing you know, easier activities on Earth to get the same stuff. Uh, there are proposals to get space-based solar. Uh, I think simple calculations will suggest it's, it's, it's not on. There was also actually, I think, a recent paper out of NASA that ran the numbers more deeply than we did and found the same thing. It's just not worth it for a variety of reasons. Um, and then um, people will talk about mining the moon. There's a lot of talk about, well, getting a fight over the resources on the moon. The problem is there aren't any good resources on the moon. Uh, and if there were, it wouldn't be worth it to go get them. It's too expensive. You maybe have heard that we should go get helium-3 on the moon. Has anyone heard this claim? Yeah, so it's just bogus. It's a really good paper. I mean, it is there in higher concentration on Earth uh, than on Earth, but we do have it on Earth, and actually it's a byproduct of heavy water reactors that we already know how to build, uh, which is much cheaper than, like, strip mining square miles of the moon. Uh, so probably no, we're not going to get rich uh, uh, going to space. There are other examples I could talk about, but probably not. Um, so what are the plausible arguments for settling space? We have what we call the hot tub argument. Uh, that's being my wife. Um, and we call it the hot tub argument. It's also called like the Doritos argument in one draft. But the basic idea is, well, who cares if there's no like philosophical reason? This is just like an option. Like me and Elon are going to space, and how dare you try to stop us? And so you know, that, that's I would say a fairly plausible argument if. Space settlement is a similar behavior to just making a transaction like buying a hot tub. No third party has a right to say no. What we'll argue over the course of the book and over the course of this presentation is actually probably humanity does have a right to say no because there's reasons to believe that adding a huge space infrastructure actually causes an increase in existential risk to humanity. Uh, but I'll get to that. The other good argument is what we call the Plan B argument. Uh, this is one Elon Musk makes, Stephen Hawking makes it. Um, and the idea is, well, humans... Uh, generally speaking, are okay. We'd like the species to stay around. Um, and so, you know, on Earth, species that tend to last are ones that spread out a lot and are very diverse, and plausibly Mars offers something like that, uh, if, especially if you can get it to where it could survive the death of Earth. But the problem is you, you have to be sure then that doing that Mars settlement business doesn't actually increase that existential risk for the home planet. But so these are the more positive ones, and, and the rest of the book is getting into the specifics to understand why we're skeptical. So I'm going to go very quickly through. Here's health issues. You're all uh, nerds, so you understand the pressure issues. So I don't have to explain the physics part. Um, but um, pressure is maybe more of a problem than you've been uh, led to believe by movies. In movies, well, you, you can be in the thing that you can go out. But so in, in a real space station, for example, we keep the pressure suits at lower pressure than you keep the spacecraft. And the reason is that lower pressure, it's just easier to operate those suits. Um, so what you do is you put pure oxygen in there. We don't do pure oxygen in spacecraft because there were uh, violent flaming deaths on both sides of the Cold War. Uh, uh, Apollo 1, of course, in the U.S., and there was a, a covered-up accident in the uh, Soviet Union, I think, in 1951. Um, these are the only people who died in space. Uh, uh, I think that's Dober, Volsky, uh, Patheev, and Volkov. They died due to pressure loss. They were coming home on a capsule. Uh, uh, what seems to have happened is a valve opened and just exposed them to space, and nobody knew what was up until they found them unresponsive on the ground, and probably they had massive uh, brain hemorrhages. Uh, so, you know, the, the general point is, like, pressure is actually a big deal. Like, if someone is dying outside the space space, you probably can't go save them because you would have to pre-breathe oxygen long enough to get the nitrogen bubbles out of your body. So that's one thing. Um, uh, let me skip through my next slide. So the next thing is radiation. Uh, space radiation is of a different type than we get on Earth, uh, often in higher quantities, and uh, we really don't know the effects. Um, so even the people on the ISS, the International Space Station, or previous space stations, have been inside the protection of the Van Allen belts. The only exception to that is the 24 dudes who went to the moon, and they didn't go very long. Um, I think the, the grand total of all the time they spent outside of Earth's gravity pool is on the order of weeks. Um, they do seem to be fine. Uh, they they, I, they uh, didn't do um, worse than average humans in terms of cancer. On the other hand, they were extremely carefully selected people. They're probably quite unusual. Um, but actually, the, the, you know, um, oh, oh, sorry. The, the other problem with beta radiation, as soon as you can get a big blast of it, uh, this is uh, from the 2003 Mars Odyssey orbiter. Um, it was orbiting it was at Mars when there was a huge blast of radiation for the sun that actually, the, the word the scientists used was that it choked on the data. Its radiation detector actually was uh, uh, permanently ruined by radiation, uh, which would be really embarrassing if you had humans on board. Um, another thing, we found this really cool paper from the 60s where um, you know, so the other type of radiation you worry about is called galactic cosmic radiation, and, and especially like big heavy ions. 
these are tracks made in a gel that's supposed to you know simulate flesh. Uh, the ones that were um, iron nuclei that left tracks as thick as a human hair. Uh, you're exposed to this in space, and we just don't have a lot of data on the long-term effects. Uh, the longest a human has ever been in space in a consecutive period is 437 days. Only a handful of people have been up for more than 300 days. The vast majority, uh, much less than that. Um, so we'd like to have more data from beyond the magnet. You can see the ISS fairly protected. Of course, it doesn't have the atmosphere. They're still getting more radiation exposure, but but we, we'd like to have more data. We're going to send people on long voyages. Uh, the next thing is, oh yeah, we found this quote. Of, this is the state of knowledge right now. It's a kind of big maybe. Um, so that's Sunita Williams. Um, she's exercising because she's in microgravity. When you're in microgravity, you tend to lose bone density very quickly. Don't miss the stat there. 1% per month bone density loss in the spine, 1.5% in the hip. That's while doing multi-hour exercise six days a week with this uh, spring strap uh, uh, That's That's very rapid degradation. You get pretty similar effects on uh, muscles. Uh, we have some cool stats. Uh, six months calf muscles loss of 13% of power uh, or, or volume. 32% of peak power. It's considered very impressive if after a few months in space you can you can walk when you get home. Um, uh, we, we left this quote, and this is Susan Helms, who actually uh, uh, thought it was kind of cool. Uh, but um, she was talking about this phenomenon that's sometimes called puppy face. So what happens is when you're on Earth, you are, your legs have to work very hard to pump blood up. In space, they don't. And what happens is, especially right when you get to space, uh, the, you get a fluid shift upward. If you ever see a picture of astronauts when they've been, especially right when they've got to space, they, they kind of look like babies. They have these pooped out faces, and you can see their legs, they're really skinny. They can lose like 30% of volume. Uh, so I called chicken legs. <laughs> uh, um, but, um, you know, that's the fun part. The, the bad part is that it seems like it has something to do with vision. So when people go to space, they reliably become more nearsighted. People who are over 40 are sent up. Uh, with what are called space anticipation goggles. The acronym is SAG. Um, and that's because they, they reliably lose vision even on short missions. We don't know why the thought is maybe the fluid shift is, is, is pushing on uh, your eyes and causing some change in structure or messing up the, the system that feeds it. But we don't really know. And where it gets a little creepy is, um, you know, uh, there's equivocal evidence of cognitive degradation in space. Equivocal, we, we don't have a ton of data. It could just be you're up there and it's really stressful for a year. But if there is like some cognitive effect and the eyes are just kind of the canary in the coal mine, that's going to be a really worrisome problem when people start going for more than a year at a time. Uh, one of the solutions is uh, what Scott Kelly called pants that suck. Um, this is uh, there's basically like uh, having a sleeping bag. It does low pressure on the bottom of your body. It actually seems to really help. Problem is, it's. Uh, Systems like this have frequently had um, accidents. Uh, so there was a story we found of a cosmonaut who almost passed out because his heart rate stuff uh, 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 started uh, going low. Scott Kelly had a very similar experience. So it's, it's, it's not necessarily a great solution. Um, and then the last thing to talk about in medicine is trauma medicine. So tra trauma medicine is when someone's bleeding where they ought not to be bleeding or they're not breathing. Uh, paramedics have to get there fast to solve the problem. We don't have a lot of data because there's never been a traumatic medicine situation in space before. We do have some really interesting studies where there are claims that in the body cavity, like the, the phrase bowel floats was used in one paper. Uh, and then when you, when you nick a surface, when the blood comes out, you know, unlike on Earth where it'll just drop in space, it forms into domes or bubbles that float. And you might ask how we know this when it's never come out for humans. It's because we have sent pigs on her dog trajectories. Uh, there, there are a bunch of studies where people did this. They just set pigs up and did operations on them. And, and if you know how this works, you know, you know on that arc, you only get about 20, 30 seconds of weightlessness. So they had to do this over and over again. Very, very dedicated scientists. Um, so that's medical stuff. And where it gets really scary, uh, we think, for the purposes of a settlement, is that you know, this is all stuff that's been done on mature adult human bodies. We have no idea what it does to children. And so that brings me to the middle part of this talk, which is, can you have sex in space? Uh, the answer is probably. Uh, there, are at least, <laughs> there are at least memoirs where people, all men, said they were up for it. Uh, but, but no evidence that it has actually happened. You've probably heard one or two uh, what I would call conspiracy theories uh, about times it's happened in space. It hasn't. These are proposals. I won't get into the details about how they work. <laughs> Uh, proposals that have been made over the years for how to uh, accomplish that in space. The Chevy van was from a book from the 70s. It was a different time. 
Um, uh, but more importantly, can you have babies in space? Uh, so this is something we really don't have hardly any data on. Uh, there have been experiments where, like, um, well, the way to say it is, you know, space stations are not uh, experiments where they have like systematic data. So for a lot of data you might want, it's just lots of grab bag stuff. So they've been like, whale legs have been to space, bull sperm has been to space, uh, geckos have been to space, occasionally rats have been to space. We have almost no data on vertebrate reproduction. We have no data spanning generations. And that's really important because often when we talk about space settlements, we say like, can you have a baby? But actually, if you want to have generations, the baby has to grow up. Uh, to have their own babies. And so what you'd really want is at least some vertebrate stays over generations. Um, because there's, there's some reason to worry about it prima facie. So in addition to all the stuff I talked about, the microgravity, the radiation exposure, there's also like weird atmosphere. You On space stations, historically, you have a much higher level of carbon dioxide. If um, things in the cabin are outgassing, trace stuff that's bad to you, it can be hard to detect. Um, and in some of the experiments, which is, as I said, we kind of grab back, and we did see stuff like... Um, messed up cell structures, uh, weird hormone levels, like weird levels of testosterone and oxytocin, uh, stillbirth. Problem is it's like just, it's not much data. So we don't know if that was freak stuff. And also because there's so much going weird in a space station, you don't know what the culprit is. Um, so where this uh, gets especially worrisome for us is, you know, you know, people often say, well, we could have a million people on Mars in 30 years. And even if the technology works, you have this problem where you probably have an environment where you should expect a higher than normal rate of kids born with problems and a much lower than Earth rate ability to take care of them, which is a potential ethical quagmire. Sometimes we'll talk about space and we'll be very open about this. They'll say these things and we have quotes in the book where they'll say things like, well, we just need to have a lower standard for what counts as valuable human life. Uh, or we'll uh, you know, just let natural selection run its course. Uh, which hopefully is just obviously morally objectionable. Um, and and by the way, the plan is to start, you know, plan B for humanity that can survive Earth. Maybe you don't want to start it with monstrous ethics. I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, and, 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 and from a practical perspective, like just getting the data, even if you wanted to get it unethically, just getting the data on how safe this is, how to do this, is the work of decades. Basically, nobody's spending on it. There's a tiny bit of research, but the agencies have historically been very squeamish to do anything involving sex reproduction. Um, and, and, and billionaires who run rocket companies who are planning to go soon are not springing for this kind of research. Uh, so, you know, that perhaps suggests a lack of seriousness or a lack of uh, concern about these like terrifying ethical possibilities. Um, and also possibly because there's almost certainly no ROI, there's no return on investment in like orbital obstetrics. Uh, so there. Uh, so where are we going to put these people uh, <laughs> that are uh, going to have all these problems? So space is big, uh, but actually the options are not so good. Um, so Mercury is really hot. We found exactly one proposal for living on Mercury where you would fit your civilization on the terminus on the day-night line and just kind of rotate with it. Uh, so you keep a good temperature, probably not a great way to exist forever. Uh, Venus is often compared with hell and gets the worst of it. Um, it's got sulfuric acid clouds. The pressure is something like 100 times Earth, and you can melt lead with the heat. And uh, if you will tell you this is true, there is like a band of the atmosphere where you have something like Earth like temperature and pressure You're surrounded by CO2, which most of the time it's not great, but in space that's a pretty good deal because carbon and oxygen are cool. Um, and you have Earth gravity. Why that's desirable to some people, I don't quite understand, uh, but, but there are serious proposals for this group called Human to, to Venus that studies it. Uh, then there's Earth, which is pretty all right, um, uh, and it's orbited by the moon, which the moon has to probably get into in a minute, but it is close, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so why would the moon be bad? Uh, so first of all, the moon is covered with this uh, stuff called regolith. It looks like it's just a nice... Sandbox, but actually, when you put it under a microscope, it looks like this. It looks jagged because it is. The reason is because you imagine the moon is a rock that's just exposed to space. It's hit by objects from space over and over and over. Also, radiation. And what happens is it fuses, and then that fused object gets shattered and then fused again. And this happens over and over and over. You imagine for eons, you eventually get something like this. Uh, it's almost certainly bad for lung. The reports from Apollo 17, Harrison Schmidt had, he said he had like an allergic style reaction. The thought is maybe you'll get something like stem grinders disease where you get um, lung scarification to where it becomes hard to breathe. Uh, it also probably messes up equipment because in addition to being jagged and statically charged, astronauts described it almost like it was alive, like it was trying to get in joints. It's also bad for heating, right? So you wear a white spacesuit to reflect the sun. 
Um, you get regular all over you, and it's notoriously happened because it's hard to walk around in these big suits. Uh, on the moon, they often fell over. And what that does is it makes you absorb more heat while it also insulates you, making it hard to radiate heat. Um, so all around that, it's, it's something we can handle, but it's going to be a huge problem. Another thing to me that's was shocking, the moon is carbon poor. It is poor in carbon. Uh, that's bad because we're carbon-based, so it's going to be hard to start a farm uh, without the carbon. We just, the, 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 to my knowledge, the most uh, intense, um, the most concentrated carbon spots on the moon. Does anyone know? Or the uh, no yes, it's it's the uh, poop bag left by the Apollo astronauts. <laughs> there there is no nice source of carbon. Uh, and actually, probably you can't get those. Really, NASA would frown upon it. Uh, <laughs> I don't think they mentioned the poop bags in particular, but the sites are kind of no no touch area. Um, what else is bad about the moon? There's a two week day night cycle, so that's two Earth weeks equals one day on the moon. So you get you know 14 days worth of intense sunlight in 14 days of night. You get these crazy temperature swings. It's also bad if you want to have solar panels. You're also exposed to radiation. There's no atmosphere to protect you. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there's almost certainly nothing worth getting from an economic perspective. All sorts of cool science, uh, but doing that thing where someone gives you money and you give them back more money after having done something on the moon is pretty implausible. It's a great location though. This is the big upside, right? So you're a mere 400,000 kilometers away. It's only a little over a second to send a signal uh, one way. You can almost have a live conversation, which would be nice during an emergency. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and also, um, you know, that also means if something goes wrong on the moon, you know, the expense of the Navy you could get back, right? Uh, and, and, and the other thing is, because the moon is uh, small, it's only about one sixth of gravity, um, and it has no atmosphere, you can launch rockets much more effectively. If you look at a rocket, on the pad on the Earth, it's about 80% propellant. Uh, it's something like 16, 70% just the machine itself, and about one to three percent stuff that goes to space. Uh, we can just barely do space from Earth. On the moon, you could do much better. That's so it's a common proposal um, uh, is, is to put a sort of gas station on the moon through um, for rockets to stop over. Okay, so that's the moon. Mars. What's so great about Mars? Well, it's part of the problem. So one, it's it's got a lot of stuff to describe the moon. It's also got perchlorate in the soil, which is a salt that's a hormone disruptor. So if you think about trying to raise your children in that environment, it doesn't sound super great. That's about half percent to 1% of the soil can be cleansed, but you will have to cleanse the soil everywhere you go if you want to use it. And also that soil gets whipped up in these massive dust storms thanks to Mars having an atmosphere. Uh, sometimes they span almost the entire globe except the poles, which is again, not great for solar panels, which is a bummer because Mars gets Earth-like days. So you could, in principle, use solar panels, except the sky is blotted out once in a while for weeks at a time, uh, which is not great. Um, and uh, but so that atmosphere is pretty cool. Though. So it's 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 about one percent Earth, so you still die real quick if you go out. Um, but it is CO two, and and normally you wouldn't think of a thin CO two atmosphere as great, but compared to the moon, which has no atmosphere, it's pretty cool because it means there's just oxygen floating around. There's also carbon dioxide. You could you could give CO two to plants to give you back oxygen if you have a supply of hydrogen. You can make water and you can make methane, which can be used uh, as rocket fuel or even in principle like fuel for like a buggy to get around Mars or something else, just a general way to, to store energy. A uh, big problem with the moon is distance. Uh, so uh, typical transfer, you're talking six months to get there, uh, about a two year stay, six months back. There are trajectories where you can get back in like a month or after staying about a month, but basically nobody wants to do that because why would you spend all this time and money to spend a month on Mars? Uh, the bigger problem for space settlement is uh, the, the launch window only opens every two years. So you are there, you are stuck. Uh, communication when you're at closest distance is three minutes each way, 22 minutes each way at longest distance. So there is no live communication back home. Um, uh, there's also less sunlight. So uh, your friend in mind, the inverse square law uh, says you get about half as much, I think it's about 40% as much light when you're on Mars as on Earth. You do a little bit better because of that thin atmosphere. So you your solar panels work at something like 50% say, but you still need to double whatever solar panel count you were hoping to use. Um, so uh, what's, what's uh, good about Mars? Well, two things basically. One is that it does have all the elements needed. It's not, it's not missing stuff like the moon is. It does have that atmosphere which makes oxygen available. Also there's water on, on, on Mars at the poles. And then if you dig down enough in those places, we think you'll get into water, uh, you know, so, not great, but great by the standards of space. It's a place, in principle, you could put a permanent human base, which is basically not true of anywhere else here. You're not going to do that on a gas giant. Some of you may have heard that you can do it on the 
moons of Saturn or, uh, or Jupiter that may be, but it takes a really long time to get there. And usually when people talk about the virtues of places like Titan or Enceladus, they're like, the atmosphere is made of methane. It's great. Um, it's free methane. Uh, so not, 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 <laughs> not, not a great sell to my mind. Um, so other options are worse, right? So asteroid belts, we have found one proposal from the 60s to live in asteroid belts. I don't think it's very serious. And then beyond that, you have the gas giants and the icy planets. Probably that idea. The one other big proposal you may have heard is awesome orbital space stations, where it looks like the suburbs are all having a dinner party. Um, and so this is obviously the most gorgeous thing ever come up with the do in space. Uh, but so these like these drawings when they were commissioned, the guy who had commissioned knew it was bogus. If you were doing this, which you won't, you would, it would be more like submarine barracks. But the bigger deal is there's basically no almost no reason to do it. I'll get to the one reason to do it in a second. Often when people propose this, they'll say kind of silly stuff. They'll say, did you know by being in this giant uh, space tourist, we can totally control the weather, we can control the amount of sunlight, the amount of rain, and everything which sounds really cool until you realize it's also trillion buildings on Earth. Um, it's not very compelling. Uh, this was kind of a, a bigger idea in the 70s, although so Jeff Bezos still pushes a version of it. But the only compelling argument, if you're talking like, during the next thousand years, is it's possible that we can't have children, can't survive long in low gravity environments, right? So we don't know the effect of spending, say, 10 years on the moon in one six Earth gravity. We basically have no insight into that. Um, there's, there's a cool experiment recently out of JAXA doing some stuff on rats, which, you know, we're, we're getting more data. We don't have a lot. But if it turns out you really do need one Earth gravity or something close to it, this would be the only game in town. But that's basically admitting space settlement is really, 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 really hard. Um, and finally, also those giant open windows are bogus too. We're not going to have that either. Um, so that's that's it. Uh, so how are we going to survive in these places? One of the big things is bigger research we don't have is how do you build a sealed ecosystem? So this is a cartoon version of uh, biosphere. You may have heard of it was a big experiment in the nineties. See if you could have a sealed greenhouse. It's sealed tighter than the space shuttle they claim. They really tried to not have interact with the outside environment except for air. Um, I'm sorry, except for the sunlight. Um, and it went okay. They had eight people on about three acres. Uh, and the, the good part is, it says playing music. I don't know. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, so the eight people went in, eight people came out. They were a lot skinnier. They, the women lost about 10% body weight, men lost about 18% body weight. Also, they hated each other. They kind of divided into four gangs. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, two gangs of four. At one point, one of them was like dry five spitting on the other. These were adults. Um, and this is to this day the biggest, best experiment we have of this type. There's still some ongoing work being done in like Europe and China and uh, in Japan, but those are like two and three prison systems. They don't actually fully close the, the loop, meaning like they're, they're allowed to bring in like condiments or in, and like meat in some cases. Um, if you wanted to have a million people on Mars, assuming it scales linearly from the size of biosphere, you need your greenhouse to be about twice the size of Singapore. Um, it might not scale linearly, but I don't know what direction it goes in because, like, these guys and gals got Arizona sunlight. Uh, also, they got power off the grid, um, and they didn't have to build their three-acre facility. So it might actually be worse than linear. We uh, we don't know. Um, I could talk a lot more about this. There's a lot of interesting stuff, but uh, but basically, we need a whole lot more science on ecology. And like with the reproduction stuff, if we started yesterday, it would take decades because ecosystems are really complicated. They had a lot of like. Problems you might not anticipate, like it, it, at one point they had problems with mildew and cockroaches. They didn't mean to get in the system. They lost uh, all their beans, except for one that was meant as goat fodder. Beans are obviously like a great source of protein. That was part of why they were getting really hungry by the end. At one point they were running out of oxygen. They were suffocating because the um, concrete structure was leaching oxygen out of the system. They didn't realize that. Um, could have been figured out for the next run, but the whole thing fell apart for financial and management reasons after one to your run and a brief start on the next one. So we need more, we need a lot more data. Um, this is one of the, to me, like the coolest things we could get more data on. It's just kind of objectively awesome. All right, last thing I'm gonna say about these uh, surfaces we could go to. So when we talk about the moon and Mars, we talk about them like they're uniform. Uh, they're just like, moon is like that, Mars is like this. Uh, but actually there's a lot of variety on the moon in particular. They're super primo locations if you want to set the space settlement. Not that it's easy, but it's way better than other places. This is Shackleton Crater. It's one of the very best spots. This is one of what are called the peaks of eternal light. So if you're on the pole, you're raised up. You are grazed by light almost all the time instead of getting two weeks of day, two weeks of night. They're not literally eternal light. It's something more like the peaks of 94% of the time light. But that's still really good. 
and you can get a little more if you raise it up on a platform. And uh, those um, peaks of eternal light are right next to what are sometimes called cold traps, or if you want to be dramatic, they're called craters of eternal darkness. And that's where you get the only water ice on the moon. It works like this. Um, this happens over eons, right? So, so something smacks in the moon, ball pedals go out, some of them are water. They get in here, the sun never shines, and they stay there, and then Jeff Bezos shows up for a drink. Um, and you, the big thing to note about this uh, that I really want to bang on is you often read an article, there's just one in Bloomberg the other day, being like, what are we going to do with the water on the moon? We can set up a gas station because we can crack water into liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. We can gas up a rocket. And it's literally true, but the thing is there's not that much water. There's about as much water as a small lake. We have some calculations in the book, and it never will replenish, at least not on human time scales. Once it's gone, it's gone. Um, and so, so the idea that we're going to have some kind of permanent uh, gas station on the moon is, is, is basically silly. Uh, by the way, it's also like that, that ice is more like stone. It's at extremely cold temperatures. It's also got like stuff in like ammonia that you'd want to have to deal with. It's really not great. Um, but if you are going to set up on the moon, these places are almost certainly the best. The one other cool thing on the moon are what's called lava tubes. Uh, I've actually been to one, but I've told you go to Hawaii. They're really cool. Uh, the basic idea is lava flows, and when it flows through, it leaves behind this, this sort of arched chamber that is, is, is quite stable. Most of the time, you can see from these depressions that it's not always stable, which would be embarrassing if you had a settlement in it. Um, but we know these are on the moon, and actually the really cool thing is there's evidence they might be really enormous, like hundreds of times bigger than anything on Earth because you've got this low gravity environment. Um, so the idea with that is if you want, you can get a jump on anyone else. So, so you know, if you don't have a lava tube to hide it, you have to put a hat on the moon and just like pile dirt on it to protect you from uh, radiation and temperature and a lot of other stuff. Uh, the theory on lava tube is you would go in and by some means you would seal off a, a section of it and then pump it with um, breathing gases. And then you could have a much easier time setting up. And so the reason I mentioned these places, we call them primo real estate or prime real estate, is because... Um, is because we worry that you know if there is some kind of scramble for the moon, even though there's no economic reason to, but we can already see like people from governments and agencies, especially in the U.S. and China, are starting to talk about you know landing on on the moon, setting up bases, and how they're going to you know beat the other side. These are the places that you're going to go for. And if you total up the area they take up, we calculated depending on what you assume, it's on the order of like hundreds of acres. It's like the size of a smaller medium farm total. And that's what brings us to space law. Uh, what can you do up there? What kind of claims are people going to try to make? Uh, so the, these are the big uh, space agreements. The Outer Space Treaty of 1967 is the governing document from outer space. You can kind of ignore these. They're just elaborations on it. But if you're curious, I can talk about them. Um, the important thing for space settlement is Article 2. Uh, no sovereignty. What is sovereignty? It's basically like uh, what you think of as a nation state. Canada is sovereign over a certain territory. It controls what goes in and out. It is the only body of government in charge there. You can't do that in space. And usually when I say this to nerds, they try to come up with a loophole. Like, I'm not a state. Can I claim it? No, the answer is no. Um, uh, can Kentucky Fried Chicken claim it? They're not a state. No, the answer is no. Can like a multinational group get together and claim it? The answer is no. I can get you why, but the answer is no. Uh, if you think of a loophole, the lawyer already thought of it long ago. Um, but here's where it gets weird, is the OST, the Outer Space Treaty, is real vague on a bunch of other stuff. So, for example, you can send up soldiers as long as they're there to behave themselves and not do war stuff. Uh, more importantly, you're uh, probably able to use resources however you want, which if you think about it is really weird, right? So it's like, for example, if you go to a big asteroid, you wouldn't be able to claim to have a government, government on it, but you could grind it up, turn it into a spaceship or a propellant or whatever you want, make it disappear. As long as never in the process did you say, this is mine in the sense of territory. It's really weird. And uh, what's happened is the U.S. Uh, has put it into place its own law to kind of fill in this ambiguity. So there was an attempt called the Moon Agreement that was going to kind of clarify and create an international body to handle this. The U.S. actually agreed to sign it, and Congress wouldn't pass it. It was considered to be like kind of socialist -y. But actually, also the, you know, the communist USSR would also not sign it because they, I guess, didn't see the benefit to them. So into the breach, the Artemis Accords. This is what the U.S. has put out. Basically, it instantiates the U.S. view, which under the 2015 Space Competitiveness Act, signed under the Obama administration, and then the 2020 Executive Order 
Under the Trump administration, the U.S. says, whatever anybody wants to do, Americans can go to space and use whatever resources we want, as much as we want, all the time. Um, the Artemis Accords uh, basically say that and most nations have signed on, and it's not just nations, the U.S. is strong-armed. It's like Germany is there, uh, Australia is on board, I think the U.K. is on board, uh, a bunch of other countries. Um, interestingly, and we think concerningly, one thing Artemis has is what are called safety zones. So when you put down your base, you can claim a safety zone of unspecified radius in the uh, document. And it, you know, so there's a perfectly good reason you would want to do this because if somebody else lands a rocket over here, it's going to kick up regular really far. We know from uh, some data when we, we recovered Surveyor 3 that that probably is kind of like sandblasting somebody with this like uh, poison doom soil. Uh, it's not good. So it's perfectly plausible. How did you get like a quasi territorial claim in a world where you're not allowed to have sovereignty? So, under the agreement, other nations can sort of ask you to move and not act like you have made a claim here. Uh, but you don't have to. And you can say stuff like, well, I'm conducting an experiment, uh, and so you can't make me move right now. Um, so, what we worry about is you can get into a world where, when there's the, the premium real estate is a very small area, you can see this guy's claimed a bunch of these craters with the water and the light. Um, a small number of bases could, in principle, claim almost all the best stuff. Uh, although it wouldn't literally be a claim, you would be essentially saying you can't land here and you have to talk to us before you do stuff here. It's a quasi turf like claim, which is kind of worrisome. Our, our, our uh, you know, joke is it's kind of like uh, the, the, the 60 space race was kind of a race to see who could do a thing first, but there were no territorial claims. There was no zero sum quality. Here it is potentially zero sum. Yes? If you're not a signatory to the Artemis yes. Accord, and you land in this area. What, what would happen? Well, you'd have to start a fight, of course. But yeah, yeah. Well, uh, an armed conflict, essentially. You, you, you would vote now. Well, so under one of those uh, treaties I heard called the Liability Convention, if you caused damage to the base, you'd be liable to, to pay the country that was damaged. Uh, or the, the state that's saying you. Now, you're saying someone is stateless. But if you, you would have to launch from somewhere, and, and so it gets a little finicky, but to suppose you launched from Cape Canaveral and said you were stateless, you would still be, uh, the, the U.S. would still probably be responsible for the bad stuff you did. Because uh, the treaty you know, is from the 60s, it sees the world as state-based. But, but who signed that? The liability. So, so all, all, all the space break talks have uh, signed on. Uh, and actually, so in, in the case of the liability convention, it was... Uh, if you know, Cosmos 954 was the time it was a Soviet satellite, nuclear satellite that dropped down over Canada and, and irradiated a small, small rural part of Canada. And they didn't, they, I think they technically didn't invoke the liability convention, but it was sort of, it was, it was a presence. And, and the Soviets did end up paying uh, to help with the cleanup. So th there's some precedence for it. Uh, but China signed this. China has signed, yeah. Signed those. Yeah, all, all the major space faring powers have, have signed this. You know, they, of course, it's, you know, it's international law. There's no uh, enforcer, so they can decide they don't care. Oh, I'm sorry, Artemis? Are you talking about Artemis? They have not signed Artemis. No, they have to, but they only have signed Artemis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. China certainly hasn't signed Artemis. They, they, I actually, under the Wolf Amendment, they might not even be allowed to. Uh, like the U.S. like has, has rules about working with China. So, so no, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but China has signed all the old agreements. Um, but, but China appears to be, and I don't want to get super off track, but China appears to be making a similar claim to the U.S. that they can also use resources. They're planning to, they, their, their agency talks about setting up mining operations and that kind of thing. So they seem to have the same view that you can do what you want with resources. Well, we say, if I'm in their place, I would say the same. Why the U.S. is allowed to? I, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 yeah, yeah. So if, if, you, if you try and recycle, and if you're in the recycling industry in space, Mm -hmm. And you try to recycle any Chinese or or Russian debris. Mm -hmm. It's technically an arc, an act of war. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I would hope it wouldn't actually kick off war. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean it's not good or bad. It's yes. just technically is it? Right, action. right. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me. I'm, I'm about to call it time. No. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So, 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 just revisiting our arguments. Uh, hot tub argument. The reason it's not just a transaction you're allowed to make is because one, if you're doing this trip for stuff, you're potentially increasing tension between nations, which could cause bad stuff. Also, just as a general matter, oh, skip past that. As a general matter, 
you know, for example, there's a serious proposal to put a million ton space station into low Earth orbit, which just seems demonstrably crazy to me. The number we like to give people, uh, it, it, you can figure out with high school physics, is if you have an object going three kilometers per second, which is slower than you go in low Earth orbit, it has an explosive yield equivalent to if it were made of TNT. Um, so we're having the kind of vast infrastructure people like Elon Musk talked about, where you're talking about thousands of daily rocket launches and million ton objects is just kind of obviously dangerous when you live down a gravity well, like we all do. Um, so that suggested is not simply a choice you should be able to make on your own if it endangers all the rest of us. Uh, as for the plan B argument, um, um, you know, so there, there's a lot of reasons. We get into this in the book in detail, but basically you need to have a base that could survive the death of Earth, just to have a genetic pool that could probably survive indefinitely if you lost contact with Earth. Probably you need at least 3,000, I'm sorry, 30,000 people. I can get into why I think that number, some people said lower numbers, but I would actually guess it's a lot higher. And it almost doesn't matter because the bigger question is, can you have economic independence, what's called autarky? Not many people have tried to estimate what you need in space to give a sense of the scale of the problem. I was talking to an engineer friend about this. He pointed out, you know, on Earth, we do a lot of our shipping. The cheapest low energy way to ship stuff is on oceans, right, which don't exist on Mars. So if you try to calculate the energy profile of, like, an independent modern civilization, it would be an enormously difficult problem. But probably the numbers are pretty terrifying. Um, the lowest estimate I found was a guy named Casey Hanmer, who used, I would say, extraordinarily generous numbers and assumed like super advanced AI robotic systems. He came up with 100,000 people. Highest number we saw was maybe a billion people um, to, to be able to survive the death of Earth. We kind of don't know. What gets tricky is stuff like microchips, for example. Probably you'd always want to ship microchips from, from Earth because like they require a lot of water. They're extremely difficult to make. They require this big globalized system to make even just on Earth. Also, there's a lot of value in a small amount of mass. So it's probably mass. So it's probably worth shipping a big rocket ship. It's going to be a long time before you can do autarky. No country is autarkic on Earth, not even North Korea. And by the way, the ones that are close to autarky would like not to be. Um, so our big proposal is, is if you want to do space animal, you should do what's called a wait and go big, uh, meaning wait until we get a bunch of science and go big because scale solves or at least helps a lot of the problems. Um, it, it gives you, uh, uh, let me not get into it, but the issues having to do with human psychology and economics. And I'm over time, so I want to turn it over to Q&A uh, and, and that's the book if you want a lot more detail. Other stuff I get into if you want is like how we're going to do energy, risk of war, uh, a little bit of economics and some other topics. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. If you don't mind. Um, by the way, first question unrelated. He was in Kate Beowulf. Do you know what that says for Hamda? No, what did he? Yeah, Kate Beowulf, I, I think I was the, your historian. You once consulted a historian in Spain. There was a historical consultant for Kate Beowulf. I was a historical consultant. Oh, Kate Beowulf. Yeah, that's right. I'm here with that book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm the historical consultant for Kate <laughs> And I'm also the his, uh, historian of the space program. So I think this story is a lot. We have a lot in common. That's yeah. right. <laughs> um, just wanted to make one announcement. Scott Kelly is in the San Diego area tomorrow. If you want to meet him, uh, just we'll, just let me know, and I, I can tell you where that is. If you, if you read our book, there's some, some, some dirty laundry about Scott Kelly. You might want to hold against him. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I hope it's not happening. We happen to have a Scott Kelly on campus. Yeah, yeah. Well, He's a professor in biology. Oh, oh different, different. different. <laughs> okay, we have a neat uh, announcement. Um, a really big stamp show is going to be in Mission Valley at the Hill <laughs> tomorrow. And then. <laughs> so, but the question is you're speaking of Musk. Yes. Uh, did you look at Musk's plan to uh, the, nu the nuclear? The, New Kingdom. Yeah. 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 Sure, sure, sure. So what you're talking about is something called terraforming. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So 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 basically, you know, there's all those problems I described on Mars. Uh so one way you could solve at least a large number of them is by some means generate an atmosphere, get a greenhouse effect going, get some plants going, eventually you've got oxygen, you could take off the pressure suit and walk around. Uh, usual proposals for that involve doing something terrifying to the poles to get all that water vapor everywhere to get the greenhouse effect and get that oxygen. So one version of it is like redirect a comet or an asteroid. Uh, another version is Elon Musk, which is you get some extraordinary number of thermonuclear weapons by some means and throw them at the pole and explode them. And I don't know, maybe, uh, you know, so I, I think actually legally, I don't think He'd be violating anything. There are environmental rules in the treaties, but they're pretty vague. He could probably do it, 
except for the part where he gets the nuclear weapons. I don't know, I don't know how he goes about that. But, but it does, for me, that sort of underscores why we would like to have a more robust regime for space regulation. Uh, because, like, <clears throat> having the power to terraform a planet in the hands of even a single country, let alone a single corporation or individual, is sort of objectively terrifying. Um, but I, I just think it's pretty fine in the sky. I, I don't think it's likely to happen anytime soon. Yeah. Yeah. It was great talk, by the way. Um, my question is that I know that like some of the beauty of Mars is that like it's possibly paleontological record for biosignatures of life. Yeah. So is there any consideration or much consideration to you know you colonize it? Have you just yeah. ruined? <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that base sample. Yeah, yeah. I think Carl Sagan somewhere said basically, who was very pro doing stuff on Mars, said if there's life on it, we should just leave it alone. Um, not everybody agrees with that, obviously, uh, and, uh, but there is no sort of legal protection for, for potential life on Mars. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we, we talk about it very briefly. You know, the, the, the money on it is if there's life on Mars, it's probably hiding in something like a lava tube, or maybe it could like, you know, hold out for these uh, billions of years since it was a wet Mars. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, so I think legally anyway, like there's no reason Elon Musk couldn't personally go in that lava tube and stick his finger in it. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, philosophically, I did, did a little bit of writing on this, of like what, what obligations we have to, to bacteria, because it's like, you, you can't say you have a legal obligation to save all bacteria, because otherwise you couldn't brush your teeth. Um, but, but what you owe marginalized, I think, is a question of like what we, to my mind, it boils down to how we feel about it as humans, like, um, you know, this is potentially a reservoir of like the most amazing science we've ever done. But yeah, my, my guess would be if we start sending big stuff to Mars, there, there's a non-trivial risk that if there was life on Mars, we'll destroy it without noticing it. Um, so why is that surprising? Humans don't show a lot of respect for life in Mars. No, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a problem. Uh, yeah. Uh, you said you you spent about five years doing research on this. Yeah. Um, was that primarily reading studies and papers, or did you get the opportunity to actually reach out and interview experts? We 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 did um, uh, do do we it was actually mostly knows in book stuff. We did always have experts go over the chapters, um, and we went to some conferences and stuff. I, I should say that the, most of the research overlapped with COVID, so it was just kind of it was a little tricky. Um, but also, there's a kind of as a researcher, there's a kind of art to when you go to ask the experts. Because if, if, if you know nothing and you go to experts, you're, you're at risk of rolling with whatever they think in particular. So it, it's often good to spend, like, if, ideally what we like to do is spend something like a year researching something and, and research like the, what's been done by the person in question before we talk to them. Um, but yeah, we did. We also, we always had people look over our chapters because, you know, this is such, a, we're, we're dealing with so many topics. There's no way to become, like, deeply expert in all of them. Um, so we tried to have... Uh, People from the relevant field. Does that answer your question? I, I can talk more about process stuff. I just worry people find it boring. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you uh, if you go to the Los Angeles Science Fiction Writers Convention over Thanksgiving, you'll find JPL, Caltech, NASA. Yeah. Sorry, what's telling you everything you want to know about the Mars sample term and all of that stuff. What What's the event again? It's the Los Angeles Science Fiction Writers Convention, LostCon. But that's where JPL shows up. They also okay. show up at the, his favorite conference, the uh, Doctor Who Convention. Nice. <laughs> so there's that. Um, there's a question. Yeah. Uh, would you? Uh, what do you favor? Bringing a lathe up from Earth to the moon or manufacturing the lathe on the moon? On the moon, yeah, that's a good question actually. So so um, there are proposals to start up manufacturing on the moon and if, you, if you're gonna have something like a permanent base, you'd like to, but I think it can get a little silly. So for example, people talk about how, you know, there is literally titanium in the moon and so therefore we can have titanium tools, but you know, it looks up to, to manufacture titanium, you need like a furnace that's at like 1800 C or something. So it's like, it's really non-trivial. If you look at say Antarctica, which is obviously much easier to get to in space, we don't try to manufacture power tools on site. We ship them in when we can. Um, you know, if you wanted, I, I feel like this stuff really only should come up in the context of trying to have a permanent earth surviving settlement and probably some of the very last stuff you do. Uh, because it's you know, it's really hard to manufacture these stuff. 
uh, on site. Um, in, in general, there's a tendency to talk about these surfaces as if because an element exists, you can use it, but we don't talk about earth like that. Usually you look for concentration. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the lathe beds seem to be a problem. Lathe Everything bed. else can be 3D printed. Oh, oh is that right? The lathe, but the lathe bed has to be manufactured on the really? Well, it doesn't have to be. Yeah, but it'd be nice. Yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and uh, the next question is uh, for everybody are you, who here is uh, uh, a fan of Pluto? In other words, being, being reinstated as a planet. I was. <laughs> so changing change roles. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering. <laughs> if Jupiter has not cleared its orbit, so I was uh, thinking, see if the young people want to take Pluto back into a planet. Maybe Jupiter could be a dwarf planet. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, 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 I happened by yeah. uh, for the temporary blindness thing that the astronaut in near sightedness. It's not blind. Near sightedness. Yeah. Okay. Were the frequency of those things happening uh, as like a function of the time that they were spending up there? I, I have to look at it. My my recollection is you even saw it on shuttle missions, which were like two week missions. So I think it's pretty rapid. Um, I I, I want to say it, it correlated with, with with time, but I don't know if it was linear. Uh, but there are papers on this. Yeah. Okay, but it's near sightedness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think anyone's got blind uh, due to space. Uh, and then to your yeah. diagram of, of a, is this like the lungs and the body? Yeah, the lungs and the body. What is an uncomfortable Freudian? Uh, uncomfortable Freudian. Uh, uh, ask your psychology teacher. Uh, <laughs> As a strong also have a lot of Yeah, Sorry. No, I thought you were going to ask about the lungs. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah. I'm just curious, um, what's, what part of your interest in the topic? So, we had done uh, a pop science book called Soonish, which was a much lighter book, which is kind of a fun future technology book. And we did a section on ways you might get to space cheaply uh, and one on asteroid mining. And uh, especially in asteroid mining, we would ask people we thought were experts or, or we thought were reliable sources about like, well, what are the rules if you want to send like a million ton optic made of iron and nickel back toward the home planet? And weirdly, and I, in retrospect, we've mostly talked to engineers and entrepreneur types, and they were like, who knows? Um, you know, and no one, and we knew that space law existed, but we didn't know, like, so, so one thing I didn't get into is there's actually a whole lot of precedent for space law and other legal regimes like in Antarctica and the deep sea bed. Um, so, so there actually is a lot of like a big, a big body of, of legal. Uh, discussion. There's the ungodly giant document called the Cologne Commentaries, where a bunch of space lawyers gathered in Cologne to like say what they think about the rules. But it was just well researched, and we were kind of like retrospectively like, oh, there should be a big book about this sort of stuff about like governance in space. We were told by the publisher not to say governance because it sounds boring, but um, but like you know, human questions, sociology, and 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 once you're talking about something like sociology, you really have to know what these places are like. I mean, maybe so we got into it. But like I said, we were originally trying to, we were imagining more uplifting. Here's how we're going to do it. And about two years in, we actually changed the thesis to be, not that we can't do it, just that the problems are like much worse than advertised. And actually, they're, you know, it might, might add existential risk to um, the human future. Yeah. Yeah. Any uh, questions from the back? Yeah. Well, you mentioned that there is a lot of miscommunication about like space colonization, space yeah. travel. Uh, in your research, like how did you sift through like the misinformation and like in your book, how do you kind of how how do you plan on tackling that misinformation in a way that people don't just read the book and not like not expect it? I, I'm starting to see people use the book to argue with people on the internet, which is encouraging. Um, so I, I think part of what goes on is most people who are writing a, about a pop sci topic, uh, especially one like this, are in favor of doing the thing. I actually was talking to a friend who's a pop sci author, and we told him like <laughs> we weren't saying you're going to get your space stuff, but he was just appalled. Like you, you, you can't write a book saying you don't get the thing. Um, so almost so one of the things we did in this book is read maybe like three dozen books from the past predicting the space future, like going back to I think the earliest one I read was from the 1920s. You could arguably there there are even some from the Victorian era, 
And um, so you can kind of, what's interesting is you can kind of see some of these narratives evolve over time and like take different forms in response to current conditions. To my knowledge, there's only three books written on the historiography of space, like the history of the history of space. Uh, they're really good. The, the, there's this one called Space in the American Imagination by McCurdy. There's one called um, Astrofuturism by um, Kilgore. Um, and so those are very valuable because you, you start to see there's a lot of stuff that gets taken for granted that's, that's not actually true. We, we actually had a, um, an article out in Foreign Policy um, about why the, the, the old bus frontier is a really bad metaphor for space for a variety of reasons. Um, you, you, you might enjoy if you're interested in that sort of thing. But, but yeah, I mean, you're right. It's tricky to like come into a field and decide a bunch of people were wrong. Um, but the thing is, it's like there is a difference between people who are in the space community and the space settlement community. And often when you talk to like like, uh, like so, so part of where we got the info about the, how dry the moon is and how little water is, we were talking to a regular planetary scientist named, uh, his name was Dan Wagner, I just remember Dr. Wagner, but he was, he was very helpful and he's an expert in these things and he is not particularly in favor of settlement. And so he gave us numbers that are, as far as I know, are always skipped in books about space settlement. Uh, they go into detail about like, actually there's not that much water. Um, which was kind of mind blowing, or something like the moon being carbon for like the idea that you would write something about landing on the moon and doing stuff so without mentioning there's no carbon, you know, just kind of astonishing. So, it, but it took about two years to feel like we had the fluency to push back on anyone. Yeah, but I thought that you could mine carbon and nitrogen from and oxygen on the moon from the soil and Mars soil. I think you can get carbon on the moon. Yeah, yeah. So, so you can get. You're, you're right. So there are hydrates on the moon, right? So you can get uh, oxygen. The problem is, so the, the, the way we like to say it is, you know, it's also true of concrete. Uh, and actually, we, um, uh, lunar regolith is actually drier than concrete. So we calculated, like, to get your, your daily allotment of water, you have to, like, burn all the hydrates out of, like, some amount of tons of lunar regolith. So it's, it's, it's to say the least, quite energy intensive. Yeah. Anybody? Uh, that note, I think we're going to thank our speaker. Oh, yeah. <laughs>